So this month, we're very lucky to have uh, Steve Shook, the Director of Software Engineering and Quality from ISHPE, talking about the results of applying methods for software excellence, the long view. There are not very many organizations that can boast a commitment to software excellence for decades. And um, ISHPE is one of those organizations. And a lot of the reason why they can do that was because of Steve's efforts. Um, I met Steve in the early 1990s um, through personal software process, I believe, with Pat. <laughs> um, and I knew Steve was one of us. For those of you that are familiar with team software process, when Steve told me that he launched his family. <laughs> Steve has also been um, a longtime co-leader of the Software Excellence Alliance, and um, I'm very excited for this talk. So. Um, welcome, Steve, and I will stop sharing so you can take over. Hey, Raphael. Hey, Daryl. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, can everyone see my title slide? Yes. Yes. Yep. All right. Yep. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for uh, asking me to prevent, uh, to present today. Um, again, my name is Steve Shook. I'm the Director of Software Engineering and Quality at ISHPE Information Technologies. And what I'd like to do to, uh, today is um, to just, first of all, uh, set a little bit of context for what I'm uh, going to be, the material that I'm going to be presenting today. I'll present um, ISHPE, uh, their long-term results, um, talk a little bit about how we've achieved those results, talk about what mechanisms we've used to improve and some lessons learned from that, and then uh, just reflect a little bit on some long-term perspectives. So the organization that I'm going to be discussing is, uh, first of all, an organization that was founded in 1986, Advanced Information Services. I began with the organization in 1990, and this was an organization that was founded by Gary Seshigiri uh, in Illinois uh, to do software uh, development and maintenance. Later on, we moved into software modernization, and in 2014, AIS was acquired by ISHPE Information Technologies. And by the way, you'll hear me mention ISHPE. ISHPE is um, it's ISHPI. It's uh, 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 an, um, an American, a Native American word uh, that means to move forward or to advance uh, or high above, and um, it very much fits in the spirit of, of the organization that I'll be discussing. So ISHPE Information Technologies, or ISHPE, is a U.S. federal uh, prime contractor. We uh, do um, many different functions in support of the U.S. federal government, um, including IT support services and cybersecurity and many other kinds of work. Um, the organization that I'm specifically going to be talking about is the AIS division. That is the organization that was formerly separate uh, as AIS, but then um, made part of Vishby Information Technologies. And uh, the focus there, again, is on software development, maintenance, uh, and modernization. Um, so AIS and then ultimately Ishby, uh, this organization began its uh, software uh, improvement, I, I said, I was going to say initiative, but it was, it's really been a journey. Uh, that began in 1992, and I'm pretty sure, um, I'm sure it was January of 1992, and I'm pretty sure it might have been January 22nd, 1992. Um, and that um, journey has led us to um, follow a set of practices that we call high-velocity development. And it's a set of practices that um, are based on what started as the software capability maturity model that you might be familiar with. Um, and later became the CMMI. Um, and for those of you who may not know, those are a set of practices that characterize um, the behaviors of the highest performing uh, organizations, and it provides a framework for how one might improve over time. And it's a, a model that has five levels um, that increase in complexity and capability, and I'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, in the mid-90s, we began um, a uh, initiative for the personal software process, and this was um, a technology that was um, uh, um, conceived by Watts Humphrey of the Software Engineering Institute, and we were one of the early adopters of this set of practices that 
really talked about high maturity um, level five behaviors um, as they would apply to a single individual, a single program or a single developer. And then later that evolved into the team software process, uh, which talked about those, how those same behaviors scale up the team. And then over time we uh, incorporated other agile practices in addition to the agile practices that were already um, part of the team software process. So the bottom line, what have our results been? Well, you can see that uh, in 1998, uh, we did not do very well on meeting our, excuse me, 1988, we did not do very well in meeting our schedule commitments. Um, this is showing uh, against the x-axis, uh, indicating the start date of different uh, projects that have uh, started during that time period, what percent deviation uh, our schedule was where we were able to complete and deliver the project. So in the 1988 to 1990s, when I started with the organization to 1992, which is when we started our process improvement effort, our average schedule deviation was uh, about 112%. And what that means is if we um, committed to deliver and complete something in say six months, what that means is it actually took us over a year to deliver to our customers. After we began our process improvement initiative in 1992, and we adopted the software capability maturity model uh, at that time, uh, we were able to start to make some uh, significant improvements in our ability to pay attention to schedule. And at that time, we were able to deliver within say 36% uh, average schedule deviation. In other words, on an average 36% late, later than what we had committed. We incorporated personal software process uh, practices after that, and we further improved. And then later team software process practices, and we, we further improved. And then we continued to refine that and um, implement uh, even further agile practices and do things even more incrementally and dynamically. And these days, our average schedule deviation is negative 0.8%. Um, and what that means is, on average, we deliver exactly on time or perhaps just a, a, a very smidge early. And so we're very proud of our track record of being able to deliver uh, on time for our customers. And we do attribute that to um, our process improvement effort that we uh, undertook and continued to execute over all that time. Another thing that I'll just mention about this graph is that this uh, indicates not only the, the average performance of multiple software projects that started during those time periods, but also the range of outcomes. Um, and it shows kind of the one standard deviation boundary around that average. And uh, what you can see is that that, um, that range of performance uh, becomes narrower and narrower and narrower, uh, which means we become more and more predictable. So now we, not only do we come closer to our commitments, but our deviations around that average also um, uh, improve significantly. We have similar results around effort deviation. In other words, if we um, told a customer that we were gonna do something in um, a thousand hours. Um, what this is saying is that, you know, in the 90s, we were taking almost a uh, hundred percent more, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, 1700 hours or uh, 1800 hours to do that work that we committed that we thought it would take uh, a thousand hours. And you can see a similar set of improvements where we, we push that down. Now, an uh, interesting phenomenon is when we implemented the team software process, our effort jumped a little bit. And part of the team software process is really getting a lot of buy-in from team members and having self-managed teams. Um, very compatible with what we now know as agile um, team behavior. And, and so uh, I think that in the early stages, we weren't able to, we didn't initially account for the extra effort that all that interaction and collaboration would take, but that has corrected itself over time. And you can see uh, in the current um, recent projects that really focused uh, in many degrees on operations and maintenance, 
our effort estimates have been within about 1% of, uh, of what we estimated. And what this means is, um, you know, in the case where we have, for example, a firm fixed price uh, proposal, effort really corresponds to cost. And so what this means is we can be profitable on a firm fixed price uh, proposal. Similarly, uh, we can take a look our, at our um, ability to deliver um, products that um, are of high quality when we turn them over to the customer for acceptance test. And uh, right now, uh, you can see that our average uh, defect density, that is defect per every thousand lines of source code, are averaging about 0.13 defects for every thousand lines of source code. That's a remarkably no, low number compared to what you see as industry, um, or perhaps what you might experience on your PC or on your cell phone. Um, and so what we see is that uh, in industry, uh, it's not uncommon to see uh, acceptance test defect densities well in excess of one defect per every thousand lines of code. And even high maturity organizations um, are, uh, tend to hover right around that one or 0 0.8 to 1.2 type of range. And one thing that I would point out is especially uh, all these uh, dots that you see on the X axis, each of those um, is a, an increment, a project that we delivered to the customer and it had zero defects. We turned it over, they did acceptance tests, they tested it uh, as thoroughly as they wanted to, and they come back and they said that they could not find anything. And that's something that we're very, very proud of, and it's something that um, gives the customer a very positive experience. It's not something that they commonly encounter in the software industry. Um, so what this means that over time, we've been able to uh, use quality as a driver to be able to deliver not only uh, delivering on time, but also within budget and be profitable. So the question is also, well, how productive is all this? Certainly, you know, wouldn't this all have a lot of overhead? Um, and the answer is that uh, through use of data, we can pay attention to that and we can push those costs down. So what this uh, chart is showing is our average cost of quality. And we began focusing on this uh, starting in 2009. And so what this is showing is on a given project, what are the appraisal costs, what are the failure costs, and what are the prevention costs, add those all up as a percentage of the total effort that you put into the project. Um, if you only did engineering work, if you never had to test, if you only had to manage and do the engineering work, you would have zero cost of quality. You wouldn't have to test, you wouldn't have to do any reviews. People would write code and it would be deployed and it would be perfect and right the first time. But in fact, we know that we're human and we can't do that. So we have to do things like personal reviews and peer reviews and um, different levels of tests, unit tests, system tests, um, integration tests. Um, and where those uh, tests um, have failures, now we need to do rework. So we need to rework from those peer reviews or rework from those tests. And then after we do rework from testing, we have to regression test. So all that we characterize as failure costs. And then there's prevention costs that go into this, uh, uh, this as well. So those comprise of things, uh, for example, retrospective, stepping back and taking lessons learned and understanding how we can change our practices to replicate the good behaviors and prevent um, the things that didn't go so well. Things like root cause analysis, things like investing in training or perhaps research and development, um, maybe even proofs of concept. Those kinds of things go into prevention. So if we look at uh, our cost of quality of all those activities, again, in, in an ideal world, these would be zero. But uh, what we've been able to do is um, improve down to an average on our projects of about 27% uh, uh, total cost of quality. If you look at industry data, it's very clear that industry averages are well in excess of 50%. And much of the, um, the reason for that has to do with um, the amount of time that's spent in rework, reworking things that were delivered to the customer and have to be thrown back, rework in 
test before we even get to that stage. Um, rework and all these failure activities. And so we put a, a special emphasis on preventing the failure activities uh, through appraisal activities and some prevention activities. But again, it's important to keep this in balance. Um, so uh, if we put too much emphasis on, you know, doing long retrospectives and root cause analysis on every little thing, our, you know, we'll get excellent behavior, maybe excellent schedule performance, maybe excellent um, uh, defect densities, but our efficiency will go down. And so we need to have high efficiency as well. And so having this low cost of quality really amounts to high efficiency and being able to do things right the first time. And so we've been able to get that result as well. And in the end, um, what we really pay attention to is what's important to our customer, how they perceive us. And so what we look at when uh, we started this uh, in 1996, we started um, uh, a review uh, after every increment with our customer. Uh, after we deliver a project or a phase or an increment, we ask them um, for the uh, products and services that we've performed during this period, have we ex uh, exceeded or have we met or do we need to improve? And we ask them to look at do we need to, have we ex exceeded or met or need to improve in terms of quality, uh, in terms of value, and in terms of timeliness? And what we see, as you might expect from uh, looking at the earlier charts, is that um, in the early days, um, 1996 to 1999, we didn't have um, very happy customers. Uh, if we look at the percentage of projects that exceeded their needs or expectations, um, it was around 10% uh, in terms of quality. It was around 11% of projects exceeded their needs or expectations in terms of value, and only 5% in terms of timeliness. As we um, transitioned and continued our process improvement efforts, what you can see is that this steadily improved. And so nowadays, what you can see is uh, almost 90% of our projects uh, exceed needs for quality, 96% uh, exceed needs for value, and uh, in uh, our recent data, all of our recent projects, 100% uh, of our uh, deliveries have exceeded uh, the customer's needs for timeliness. And so this is something that gives us a, a very clear understanding that what we're doing is value added from the customer point of view. And you can imagine um, the impact that has on um, repeat business, on, um, on our uh, performance reviews that come from our customer. Uh, as a US federal government contractor, we have, uh, as a DOD uh, contractor, there's something called CPARs. And so those are formal contractual uh, feedback from our customers. And uh, you, you can imagine uh, the results that that kind of performance uh, conveys uh, back to the project team. Uh, and then uh, finally, in terms of uh, achievement, uh, two awards that we're very, very proud of that uh, are derived from all of this. First of all, the IEEE Computer Society Software Process Achievement Award, and also the um, uh, what's called the GISLA Award, the Government uh, Information System Leadership Award. Um, these are awards that are um, recognize uh, value and accomplishment in terms of software process improvement and also um, in terms of uh, security uh, for, uh, for our practices. And so we're very, very proud of these um, very prestigious awards. In terms of uh, the models that we've used to um, steer our improvement, um, I mentioned early on that we started with the software capability model as a guide for how we might go about improving over time. And you can see that uh, as a five-level model, uh, our uh, performance uh, in terms of the models tracked very well with our performance with uh, the other metrics that are important to the organization um, in terms of schedule performance, in terms of cost performance, uh, effort in terms of quality of our delivered products, in terms of efficiency and cost of quality. 
So um, as I mentioned, we began our software process improvement effort in 1992. We have our we had our first appraisal, uh, um, a software CMM B B A I P I, and that revealed that we were still level one. But we certainly realized that we had started uh, uh, made a lot of progress improving. By 1999, we had achieved level three. Um, by the early 2000s, we had achieved level four, and finally by 2005, we had achieved software CMM level five. One thing that uh, approach that we took uh, was that it was never in our um, goals to get a badge uh, in terms of achieving a certain level. What we all what we always focused on was business performance. We used the model as a guide to say what are the best practices that are known to the industry and how uh, is it best to apply those to our particular projects and our organization and implement those practices in a way that made sense from a business and project and engineering standpoint. And then assess ourselves to determine what uh, weaknesses still remained and what might be important to focus on next. And achieving a certain level was never uh, a goal. Um, that level achievement happened organically. Uh, what this does show, however, even after um, transitioning to the CMMI uh, model, uh, CMMI dev, uh, we continued to retain uh, those high maturity practices um, uh, even uh, as recently as our most recent appraisal in November 2019. And we continue, um, many of you may know that um, the, the CMMI model has transitioned to CMMI 2.0, and we're implementing those activities uh, even now um, because they continue to provide valuable and important guidance for us. So those are our results and what we've been able to achieve. So now what I'd like to focus on, how did we do all that? How did we uh, um, achieve those accomplishments? And as I mentioned, we now, um, use a set of practices that we call internally as high velocity development. So these are a set of practices at the individual level, at the team level, and at the organization level that really form a toolbox of practices that individual teams can draw on and tailor to individual uh, project and customer needs. So for example, we have a process asset library, IPEL, uh, uh, as it's called, and it contains things like policies, procedures, um, standards, templates, guidelines, uh, statistical techniques. It's a whole set of, of um, assets that are available for project teams to draw on. We have uh, data that we've accumulated over a long uh, period of time in terms of the sizes of things that we've built and how long in terms of hours they've taken us and things like productivity rates and defect injection rates and defect removal yields and estimation accuracy capabilities. And so project teams start out are able to draw upon that data and use the most relevant data that's um, appropriate to a given project to estimate new efforts. Um, we have secure software development lifecycle practices uh, that come from industry. We draw on practices from ISC squared and OWASP and CWE SAN. Um, one important aspect is that we draw upon our culture. Uh, we've been able to sustain our culture uh, for a long period of time and really foster this focus on quality and security and service to our customers um, and uh, attention to detail and being process oriented. And this culture is infused and it is part of our toolbox as well. Uh, we have uh, training assets that we leverage. We have support from our software center of excellence, which um, assist and provide support to uh, individual projects through quality assurance oversight and configuration management support and our software engineering process group and coaching and mentoring and training capabilities. Uh, and we have management and oversight support from our program managers and development managers. And we have tools and technologies that include project management tools, ALM tools, VM tools, automated testing tools. So there's a full suite of um, of dimensions 
that all go into this toolbox that we call high velocity development. So then how do we use those uh, high, de high velocity development uh, practices um, on individual projects? Well, we do a project launch. And for those of you who are familiar with the team software process, you're familiar with this, where a project team will take an understanding of the project needs and the customer input and the project attributes, and they'll tie that together guided by the launch process and by organization management guidance from within ISHB, from the program manager, development manager, and executive management, as well as coaching support. And what they'll do is they'll pull from that toolbox and they'll systematically select the elements from the toolbox that make sense for the project. And then they'll systematically tailor those elements to um, provide um, uh, uh, the appropriate um, mechanisms to execute the project. So what that means is that we have, um, we have mechanisms, you can think of them as factories, that are used um, to actually execute that project. And they can range from something that's very simple, like a little mini waterfall for maybe a one-person project that just goes through its phases and delivers. Maybe it's like a proof of concept to something that's more complex, to something that extends to full enterprise level development. And so the appropriate team size then executes that little factory that they created in the launch, all those, uh, those mechanisms, and they take uh, those inputs that come from the customer, their requirements, um, their, ne their, uh, their needs, their environment, et cetera, and they execute that project and they produce deliverables. And so those deliverables, those completed systems and services come out the, the back end. But what's important is um, not only that we complete those services and systems and we deliver them well, but also we have a lot of data. Out of that, we get best in class performance capabilities. And we have a ton of project data that comes out of that performance that we capture. So all those practices that small teams, medium teams, large teams, enterprise-sized teams execute, those are all instrumented and they're captured and they're digested and they're fed back, back into the organization, uh, back into that toolbox with innovations, with those lessons learned, with those process improvements. And that's really the mechanism that we've been able to use over the long run, uh, over, uh, over 28 years of doing this over and over and over again and feeding those back into the toolbox in order to um, produce results and capabilities um, that we're very, very proud of. So I want to take a step back now over the long view. If we think back to where we were um, back in 1992 when we started the software process improvement journey, what was our organization doing? We were a small organization of about you know, 10 to 20 people. And what we were building was PC applications. Um, I personally was building applications in C. Uh, I was using a PS2 uh, in MS-DOS, uh, not even Microsoft Windows at that time. You compare it to what we're doing now. We're building mission critical enterprise systems. We're doing uh, cloud development and migration. We're implementing uh, you know, the latest practices like DevOps and DevSecOps. And so you, and you, you think about over time, all the transitions that have happened, all the changes in technology, all the ch changes in the way software gets done. Um, you know, when we started, we didn't have uh, email. You know, we had, you know, maybe I remember when we got our fax machine. So you think of the transformations that have happened in this industry over these 28 years. And there's so much that are different. There's scores of different projects and project instruments and hundreds of different project teams and radically different uh, technologies. Um, but what's consistent across this arc from 1992 to today is the fact that we've been able to consistently improve our performance. And that pr uh, performance has been independent of adopting a new technology or a particular team leader or a particular superstar software engineer. 
we've been able to sustain that independent of all those different factors. So I guess some key perspective that I would bring stepping back is um, I ran across a letter that uh, our founder, Gary Steshigiri, wrote to Watts Humphrey shortly after our software process improvement uh, effort started in 1992. This letter is a letter from uh, August of 1992. And um, I remember as a, as a young programmer, being astounded when Gersh kicked off uh, this software process improvement effort in 1992. He had come back from a conference. I believe he had heard Watts Humphrey speak. And he said, this is what we need to do. As the, as the president of the organization, this is what we need to do. And he read Watts Humphrey's book. Um, he gave us each copies of managing the software process. And he um, had all of us read it. And he said, this is where we're headed. This is where I want to take the organization. And he started a number of key initiatives and he pushed them down. He, at that point, they were called committees. Now they've turned into what we now know as our software engineering process group. Um, and he took certain actions and he gave uh, the organization a push in a direction. And so what has really remained constant over all this time is illustrated by this letter, that top-down leadership of uh, setting a direction for the organization to focus on continuous improvement, incremental improvement, to focus on quality as a driver, um, preventing uh, needless rework in order to push down costs and become more uh, predictable in terms of schedule because Poor quality work, defective work is inherently unpredictable. You never know how long it's going to take to, um, to fix that last defect. And so one of the first things he did was he created a mechanism that we called the process improvement that he called, the Watts Humphrey suggested as the process improvement proposal mechanism. And this enabled software engineers, developers, and other project team members to suggest improvements to the, um, to the organizational practices. Um, and we had a repository, what's now IPAL, our uh, Ishbi Process Asset Library. We created that repository, and we began conducting postmortems. Uh, now we call them retrospectives, and um, we use those to understand lessons learned and actually improve our process asset library. We actually make sure to improve artifacts. The other thing this shows is that. He focused very early on training um, and bringing in experts. Uh, he reached out to Watts Humphrey himself and he invited him to Peoria, Illinois and said, please speak with us. Please show us how to do this. Please explain to us what you think is important, why you think is important, and, and um, how we can learn from uh, other teams and from other organizations. Um, he taught us to focus relentlessly on data and he kept a focus on incremental improvement. And all those elements are in this uh, letter back from uh, 1992. By the way, I didn't paste the draft of this, which was actually printed on a dot matrix printer. So some final thoughts that I could share with you um, as we step back and look on this history is that software act development activities, they exist uh, within an ecosystem. It's not just a single individual and the individual programmer's skills or certification or training. Those are all very important and they've always been important and they will always continue to be important. So necessary, but not sufficient. Those individual's practices exist within the context of a team. And so the practices and the capabilities of the team can positively or negatively affect what individuals are capable of. Similarly, the individual's capabilities taken as a whole comprise the capabilities of the team. Now that team exists within a larger organization and that's why the software CMM and the CMMI were created. What is the capability of the organization? Um, what are things like having uh, an, an organization level uh, process asset library and having things like organization training and um, 
focus on integrated software management and so forth and so on. These sort of organizational perspectives, those are all important. All those are, effect, are, are translations of the personal software process, the team software process, agile practices, and the software CMM and the CMMI. But I would take that one step further, and that's that the capabilities of the software organization exist within the context of an enterprise. So excellence in software isn't only achieved at one level. They all interact with one another. Just as a superstar software engineer um, can just really struggle when they're put on a dysfunctional team, and one poor team member can undermine the, an, an entire project team. Similarly, uh, we need the support of the enterprise to make software organizations um, uh, effective. And so what that means is things like excellence in recruiting and human resources and contract and finance and IT support, all these sort of corporate enterprise capabilities, and I say the word capabilities, those are important enablers of software organizations, and it's one of the reasons that we've been able to be successful uh, and that we continue to focus on these efforts. So there's a variety of frameworks, not only the CSP and the TSP, but the CMMI, now CMMI uh, Dev, CMMI Services, there's ISO 9001, there's Six Sigma, all these have focuses on different parts of the organization. And looking at all of this as an ecosystem is, I believe, um, looking back over these 30 years is an important enabler of the success that we've been able to achieve. I'd like to close by first saying thank you, um, first of all, to Watts Humphrey that I, I, I miss a great deal, uh, his insight, but he's written so many books and we still continue to be inspired by him and the work that the Software Engineering Institute has done, and in particular, the SEI's TSP team. I want to thank all of the software team members at um, formerly AIS and now the ISHB AIS division. Um, all of those team members, all of those past and present software developers, programmers, software engineers, technical writers, all those team members, architects, project managers, et cetera, all of those results really belong to them. It's their execution that um, has delivered for our customers, and it's their collective uh, improvement suggestions that have made this possible for us. And I do want to uh, specifically recognize two of my colleagues, uh, Barty Pereni, Director of Software Process Improvement, and Prasad Pereni, Director of Software Development. Um, they're great friends of mine, and I treasure working with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And then finally, Gir Seshigiri, uh, AI was founder back in 1996. He, he hired me in 1990. He continues to serve on the board of directors of Ishpi Information Technologies. And he, um, he looked up to Watts as his guru, and we look up to Girish as inspiration uh, on a daily basis. And so I just want to express my appreciation to all of these um, uh, folks that really have made our success possible. Thank you very much for allowing me to present to you uh, this day, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So feel free to unmute if you have questions or if you don't want to unmute and you want to type them into the chat box, um, I'll be monitoring that. Um, I guess, Steve, I have a question. Um, you know, what do you do when your customer has lower maturity than you? Has that been an issue? Like, how do you deal with, you know, I know that was a big issue um, for many organizations that were CMM level five. Sure. Well, it doesn't help, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, um, I, I would say it's not a showstopper. Um, a lot depends, uh, what I would say, is on the relationship and the working arrangement uh, between the customer and the, um, the, the, the software team that's performing the work for them. And there's no doubt that, um, you know, a dysfunctional customer organization can really limit the ability of software uh, teams uh, to 
deliver as well as we uh, would have. But on the other hand, uh, we found that we've been able to um, really take advantage of the best practices that we have um, in order to help to manage that. So when you think about practices such as risk management and communication practices and um, feedback loops, all of those things have been very, very important. Um, you know, a project that we started even as, as recently as um, a, a year and a half ago, um, it was not a panacea by any stretch of the imagination. We had some real, uh, real struggles. And so it's important to remember that even though the results uh, have been results that we're very, very proud of, they're not without um, struggles and difficulty. But the mechanisms that we have in place, and we say within our family and within our organization, remember what you know. Those best practices give us good mechanisms to manage those difficult customers and to give us the best possible chance of a good outcome. Um, questions by anybody else? I've got another question. So I think one of the things that's striking is like to just, you know, talk, can you tell us just a little bit more about all the technological changes, you know, of starting like in C on PCs to whatever you're programming in now, how has what your, your um, quality efforts done to help you transition to new development environments, new development approaches, things like that, new languages? Well, the first thing that I guess I would say is um, regardless of the deliverable and re regardless of the technology, um, doing things the right, doing things right the first time is a really important concept for us. Um, to really step back um, and realize that throwing something out there and needing to rework it and rework it and rework it is not necessarily, uh, it, it is not a good mechanism for good performance regardless of your technology. Now there's a, a time and a place for that. For example, prototyping, rapid prototyping in order to manage risk, right? You want to iterate and you want to get through and learn as, 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 as much and as frequently as possible. But when it comes to creating final deliverables, um, it is important to do the best job you can, no matter if it is writing a one page uh, technical summary for a customer that is delivered, um, or whether it's a, um, a, a phase review report, or if it's delivering an enterprise system, it pays to do it right the first time. So that's a technology independent concept that we've applied since 1992, and we've seen the results of that. Um, now, on the other hand, we can't ignore that, you know, certain practices, when we first started uh, using the personal software process, uh, many of the listeners may be aware that it has a compile phase, and we track defects in compile. As technology has progressed, that's no longer a value-added activity for us, and that has fallen by the wayside. On uh, recent projects, uh, you know, for a long time, we have tracked um, defects found in unit tests. As we move to automated testing and uh, DevOps kinds of practices, um, even tracking unit test defects separately as, a, as, a, as separate from the design and development cycle has been uh, challenging and it's forced us to think about these practices in different ways. And so things like DevOps, things like automated testing have um, triggered us to revisit, step back, adapt, see what makes sense, see what's efficient for project teams and to take advantage of that. Um, so the answer is yes, those, uh, those technological changes have had a marked impact on how we approach uh, quality. But uh, regardless of that, I think it's the same theme throughout that we want to focus on doing things right the first time when it comes to an individual delivering to the team, team delivering uh, for system test, and then the team delivering to a customer for acceptance test right the first time. Okay, so Steve, we have um, um, 
two, uh, well, I think we have time for two more questions. So one question that came in through the chat is, can you say a few words about onboarding and integrating new software developers? Sure. Um, that is uh, one aspect of our practices that um, has served us very well, is we have developed and tailored um, a great deal of training over time. Uh, you know, back in the early days of adoption of um, the personal software process and the team software process, we had uh, a great deal of emphasis on training in those practices so that every uh, engineer knew what was expected of their um, process work as a, a developer on a team or as a te working team member. That has evolved over time into, um, I would say, highly condensed just-in-time uh, training and mentoring. And so we've developed a, a set of checklists and steps that when we bring on a new team member, it focuses on what do they need to know in of the organization, uh, what do they need to know about you know, where they fit into the organization, what do they need to know about how the team behaves and what practices uh, integrating with the team are important and what do they need to do as individuals um, in terms of time tracking, in terms of defect tracking, in terms of um, communication practices. And so uh, we assign a mentor and uh, there's an individual who's assigned to do just in time training and mentoring for that individual uh, based on all those you know, dozen or two dozen different topics. And so we are able to systematically bring on new team members and mentor them. Um, we don't do typically anymore that huge upfront, you know, heads down training. Okay. We focus much more as a just in time. Okay, we've got two more questions here, Steve. Have you tailored TSP, for example, launches, weekly meetings, earn value tracking to support rapid turnaround required for DevOps, DevSecOps? We absolutely have, and I, it goes back to um, one of our uh, the slides that I showed earlier. Um, maybe it was around 12, 10. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah. is the slide. Um, and it's absolutely true that um, we have tailored for, um, for these uh, current DevOps, DevSecOps practices, and every team tailors, no matter what technologies they're using. Um, whether they're using DevOps or before they were DevOps or, you know, back in the 90s when they were waterfall. Um, tailoring has always been um, something that's been integrated into our process. Okay, another question. It said that success in the slides was often defined by shipping a product to spec. In many technological endeavors, one of the goals is to provide a unique innovation that enables a new tech tech or commercial frontier. In these cases, it can be hard to provide upfront specifications. Has the application of these processes been correlated to that kind of success? So I guess, you know, are, how, how does it affect your ability to innovate and actually just, you know, meet what the customer actually needs, not necessarily what they say they want? Well, I guess what I would, um, how I would answer that is, um, yes, uh, regardless of whether we're able to deliver in terms of, you know, uh, uh, only on schedule or only in terms of a certain defect density, it kind of steps back to, are our customers receiving value for the work that we're doing? Are we meeting their needs? And what our customer feedback mechanisms tell us, independent of any specific small metric, is that, uh, and by the way, uh, in addition to answering exceeded or met or need to improve on these three dimensions, we give them an opportunity to um, write a narrative, to give comments. And those comments and these kind of feedback in terms of, of value, for example, uh, tell us that, we, uh, that it has been effective in helping us to meet their needs um, on these kinds of projects as well. I would also think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think your cost of quality also helps you to, um, you know, because you have the low cost of quality, you have time to innovate and be creative. Would you agree with that statement? Well, I, absolutely. Um, you, you know, in the, uh, I, I remember in, you know, 1992, 1993, 1994, where there were people, they didn't uh, stay very long at, at uh, AIS after that, but they really pushed back that, you know, oh, this is going to interfere with my creativity as a, as a designer. 
<laughs> and I, many of us on this uh, call maybe have heard that argument. And actually, it's really the opposite. We give a structure for the general progression of how things should happen and how as a team we agree that we're gonna measure and progress through the project. But the fact that we're able to prevent defects and do things right the first time frees up so much time to be able to invest in the upfront stages of projects, things like research and development and proof of concept and innovation that otherwise we would have just been shortcutting all that and trying to get to the product because we're so busy trying to fix defects. Okay, last question. Quality and schedule challenges tend to increase with project size. Can you comment on the typical project size or size duration over the last few years? Um, what I would say is that there's a wide variety of, of project sizes. These range from one person projects uh, that you know have uh, monthly deliverables, you know, monthly um, uh, sprints and uh, deliver uh, a, a work product every month and that's been continuing over, you know, a, a period of years to, you know, significant modernization projects that have had, you know, in the range of um, uh, 17 uh, people on a, on a project team. Um, and then, um, we also know that we're able to scale this up by combining multiple project teams as well. Um, and those you know, efforts could last for multiple years in order to accomplish a significant milestone like the modernization of a significant enterprise system. So that's the kind of range we'd be talking about. Okay. So Steve, um, I wanna thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, do you, thank can you very I, much, I enjoyed it. 